matter where you come from, it's alright. I came up from the bottom of a bottle with rebels and desperados. It was long days and hard nights, but I had to struggle for my dream. Cause nobody else could see it. I was no one to turn to somebody with just a little faith. There's nothing I can achieve. Yeah, I was going the wrong way and then I turned right. Only matter where you going Nobody giving me none I'm placing the better myself and I'm all in I got the mind of a broke man Mixed with the heart of a lion I'ma keep giving my all cause That's just who I am But if I could be anybody I wanna be me Yeah, I just wanna be I'm Robert Kearns and I recover loud Welcome to another episode of Recover Loud A TV talk show dedicated to ending the stigma of substance use disorder Presented by Recovery on the Road, a Facebook group that Lori and I started in June of 2020. We started the group to help provide connection, support, and resources to as many people as we could reach. Throughout the years, we've done as much as we can, partnering with different organizations and helping out where we can. As part of our travels, we got to meet Robert Kearns of Bangor. Welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My recovery journey wasn't easy, but every bit of it was worth it. For seven months, I was homeless, living in my car. In order for me to stay on my path, I had options. I could have moved home, back to the neighborhood where I was from, stayed with my friends, and gone back to the same lifestyle. Instead, I stayed in an area where I knew nobody and kept to myself, focused on getting better. It was the first time in my life I was ever really homeless. Um, though for many years, uh, I couldn't afford rent and would stay with family and friends. Uh, and I never really considered that homeless until later on when I realized you know, I didn't have any options. Uh, my only options at that time were to use the people around me. And uh, being homeless, living in my car, really humbled me. And I got to see what it was like for people um, who suffer out there on a regular basis. Robert Kearns is somebody who helps those people. He calls them our neighbors without walls. And he's done lots of great things. So I'm glad to have Robert here and look forward to what he has to share with us. Robert, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing today, the different organizations that you're part of, and, and what you do on a regular basis? Uh, I created uh, the People Streetlight Outreach in 2020, in March, and uh, it was a direct response to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic or pandemic. And uh, what happened in Bangor is a lot of people got cast out into the streets because of the shelters close closing and uh, limited spacing to have people inside. So what we did is we turned our attention to feeding people and helping people you know, get supplies to survive living outside. And uh, in doing so, we found out a lot of people suffered from uh, drug disorder and uh, mental health issues. And uh, we started delving into tackling those issues for people, where initially we were just trying to bring people food. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's really important, uh, the, the work you're doing, because uh, as you said, you know, people had to figure out how to stay alive survival mode. Um, you know, our whole time, my whole time using, I lived in survival mode. And, uh, you know, having organizations like yours doing the work that's, that's necessary, um, you know, I didn't know about them before. Um, you know, I don't know if there was programs before you started it in Bangor, but, you know, when I was living in my car, uh, it would have been great to know that somebody was out there and, you know, could have given me a meal because, you know, I didn't always have money to feed myself. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have friends, supportive friends in this area um, to really provide those needed supports and, you know, the resources. So um, I appreciate all you do. And, Thank you. Um, you know, I think getting that message out there that you're out on the streets doing this hard work, um, you know, it is pretty important. So can you tell us what you do 
on, on a daily basis, you know, where are you going, what, what it is you're doing? Yeah, we try to go down to uh, the local bus hub every, because that's where everyone goes through every day, and we try to bring a meal down there every day at noon. And uh, we have a website like you do that we inform people. Now what we do is we come down with a meal and uh, give you a bunch of information for dessert. Uh, we have, can, uh, you know, I'm working on the largest uh, interactive uh, Google map that has every resource that's available to someone in eventually the state, but we're working on Bangor, Penobscot County, and we're going to add recovery on the road, of course. Absolutely. <clears throat> but uh, what we do is we come down there with food, and while we're there, I try to help people uh, get into those services for mental health and uh, opiates and uh, drug addiction treatment and uh, housing. You know, because I do believe in a housing first model, because I've been homeless and I know what it's like to be homeless. And it was in the last year, and like you were saying, your story is so familiar, because uh, I wasn't homeless until I was sober. And I started dealing with life on its terms and realizing that I was really slacking on a lot of things. And I'll be honest, I thought I had it going on. You know, I really did. <clears throat> and, uh, but it snowballs. And then uh, learning to live is what I had to do because being a good person and being positive really wasn't enough. I had to relearn how to live. Yeah. And uh, when I encounter these people that are homeless, our neighbors without walls, I see that they have learning how to live from a very darker place than, than I was. And I just had to do something to help them. So Penobscot County Cares is an a organization I'm very passionate about. I support all the shelters in town and the, and the warming shelters that have opened up in Bangor. Like you said, when I first started started this, there was AA and NA, and, uh, and it was really hard. We fight these battles in a closet where we were using and, and drinking and everything so behind closed doors. And, and to say I recovered loudly is pretty quiet because I, I ruffle feathers. You know, I sit, tell it like it is, and some people don't want to hear it, but I'm educating them because I've had people two years ago tell me I'm crazy that are right by my side now because they see what I see. And it's these websites where I can go live and show you what's going on with the permission of the people that I'm with. And I never, you know, I try to stick to not giving up anyone's anonymity unless they're willing. Nowadays, we are re willing to recover loud and say it proud, I want to live. Exactly. Um, and by recovering loud, um, you know, I do feel that that's keeping me alive. Yeah. Um, and you know when we decided to do this show, uh, because we're not we're not TV people, Lori and I, we didn't know anything about what was going on when we came to the studio. Um, but an opportunity was presented to me where I can reach, you know, more people. Yep. And you know when I started the Facebook group, uh, originally it was started to share our recovery journey with our friends and family because I felt, you know, and, and it's part of my my stinking thinking. I felt me sharing my joy and my excitement about my recovery was annoying to some people. So I started the group just as a way to, to share that. Um, and when it reached 100 people, you know, I, I had a tear in my eye because there was 100 people that wanted to share in that journey. Um, and then I started seeing people that I had never heard of before. And people from Germany, people yeah. from England, and people from France and South America were joining the group and it was during the pandemic and it showed me that people were starving for connection, you know, in a time when, when connection wasn't possible. Um, and it, you mentioned the anonymous programs and, you know, they've done a lot of good for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found in my own journey was I didn't know anything about it because everybody was anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I understand and believe their philosophy, um, you know, to get started. But at some point, I had to break free from that. And I had to start telling people that, you know, these meetings are Wednesday night. You know, you can go there at 7 o'clock. Um, you can call this person and they'll help you. Um, because I didn't know who to call and who to talk to before. Um, so having somebody to tell me who was available, uh, you know, and where these meetings were and, and how to get to recovery, you know, that made the difference for me. So if I can make the difference for anybody else by getting out there and saying, you know, this is how you do it, or this is how I did it, and maybe it'll work for you, um, and telling you about every possible program out there, because I want to save a life.
I don't come from a childhood of, of uh, any trauma or anything like that. Uh, I was raised with by hippies, so uh, it started out as a, a pretty good time. And uh, you know, I would go see the Grateful Dead and have a little little fun and stuff. You know, and smoke grass. But once uh, once I met alcohol, I met my uh, my new girl, and, and yeah. I fell right in love with alcohol. And uh, you know, I always thought that is if I could keep things functioning, that it, that it was okay. And then it, I was a follower to the party. Like I, I was the lead singer of the band, so it would seem like I was the leader of the party. But really, a lot of people brought stuff to me, and. I was an adventurer and I tried anything and that got me in some deep, deep trouble. Uh, heroin, and all, all, anything that, was, that came around, I tried it and, and I realize now that I'm allergic to it and uh, I can't do any of that stuff. I overdosed twice when there wasn't Narcan and thank goodness I had people around me that back in the day they put you in the shower, poured water all over you and ice and all your friends saw you naked and you were embarrassed and if you survived you were very lucky and I'm very fortunate to have survived the two that I did. Because uh, that was from fentanyl, but that was before there was this fentanyl they're creating now. It was out of a patch. I just drinking it right out of a patch, which sounds insane, it's insanity to me. And, and when I think about the things I've done, I think that's, I'm talking about somebody else, because I am. Yeah. That's not me anymore. Because I had been prescribed it before, it didn't seem so scary to me. You know, I, I was kind of like, oh, okay, I know what that does. I know how that will affect me. I know, I know I can handle it. Um, and then in October of uh, 2018, I, I had my last overdose. Um, we didn't have Narcan. There was no Good Samaritan law. Um, you know, so it was understood that if you know one of our friends fall out, falls out, you know, we do what we can, and then we walk away. Yeah. You know. Uh, I was grateful that I was able to walk out, you know, by the grace of God. Um, I came out of that room on my own. And, uh, you know, now I'm on my mission to, to help others. That's um, awesome. You know, speaking of Narcan, uh, a couple years ago when I first met you, uh, I got to train you in distributing Narcan. Um, I've given you a couple hundred doses to hand out. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you know what you're doing in, in the neighborhood to, to spread awareness and, and share that resource? Well, I can say the Narcan you've given me has saved saved at least one or two lives. There's a, some some convenience stores in Bangor that I that I would supply, and I know that they've stood two or three people up, and uh, a couple of them are still on a sober journey. Which I'll be honest, if I can share save one person, I'm golden. But saving dozens is just a miracle, and I thank you for training me for Narcan. I come, I mean, when I first heard about the needle exchanges and Narcan and all that, I was just as stubborn as everyone else, even though I'm an addict. Mm -hmm. I thought, you're going to handle all this stuff out, you know, and uh, cookers and all that. And I just, I've been educated by this experience of doing the People Street Light Outreach. I know so, so much more now than I did as an addict. And then getting sober, going through all the programs and all that, I had so much in my toolbox, but I didn't figure it out until the last couple of years about what, what's really going on to me. And uh, Narcan saves lives. I 100% think it should be, everybody should have it. You know, even if someone has a nasty taste in their mouth about it all, you should have it around because someone, someday it'll be one of your relatives and you could save their life. And what, what a gift, what a gift. Uh, in Bar Harbor in this park, you know, I was listening to the scanner and I heard there's an overdose somewhere. And I turned around, it's right on the grass next to me. Wow. And these guys had already given six, uh, six intravenous. And I came over my backpack and just started slinging Narcan through the air. And they, he hadn't come around and the Narcan you gave me brought him around. And I look over, the police and ambulance are running up and we had already gotten it done. Yeah. Goosebumps, I bawled, bawled my eyes out you know, because it was beautiful, and uh, I still contact with this person. I'm on him, on Messenger, you know, and I and uh, he's still fighting that journey. Because as silly as it is sometimes, you can stand right up and get the scariest time of your life and go right back out, and it just, it's a, uh, it's painful to watch. Yeah, we're just sharing valuable resources and information. Um, you know, I belong to some Facebook groups that do not allow me to post, and to me, that's absurd. It is. You know, and those are some of the, the stigmas that we're running into. Um, 
one of your groups uh, is a scanner page, and I know that when an overdose happens and, and you bring it up, there's all kinds of opinion. Um, Two sides of the coin on that scanner page about addiction. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's, it shows society's view, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, what are some of the things, some of the other kinds of stigma that, that you see out there, and what do you try to do to, to stop it? Well, uh, the website that I run has 37,000 people, yeah. you know, from all over. And they, like you say, they're, some of them are from other countries, but the opinions are both sides of the aisle. And uh, what I try to do is educate those. I try to educate everybody from what I know because we are all different and we all think different and we also all react differently to recovery and drug addiction. So it's such a complicated issue, really, that how can you really... Uh, fault someone for their own opinion unless it's insanity, you know, because I don't, I don't uh, tolerate the word junkie at all. I don't tolerate uh, talking down to anyone that's suffering such a serious illness, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I used to get really mad, really mad, and especially early in my recovery, I'd get so mad and I'd get in these fights with people where we'd be meeting each other places, you know, and getting mad at each other about recovery. That doesn't help anyone. So uh, now I just try to engage lightly and just keep the information come and uh, let people know, because I've been educated and we have brought people around that would have told me, you are crazy to uh, put so much time and effort helping your neighbors without walls. You know, some people tell me those same people wouldn't help you back, and then guess what, they have. They've helped me back more than they know, and they don't even know it by keeping me sober. Like you say, this work has kept me alive. Yeah. You know, I've, I, I really think if, if I hadn't started doing this work, I'd be gone. You know, for almost 20 years, I knew using substances as a coping mechanism. That was all I had, you know. Uh, if, if the power got shut off, I got high. You know, if really? I got fired from a job, I got high. Um, you probably lost the job from getting high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I plenty. know, I've done it. I've, yeah, 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 same thing. Um, you know, but when, then it became, you know, a celebration. When I got a job, I got high. Um, you know, and you know, kids' birthdays. I Ash got, Wednesday, whatever. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it was a daily need. Yeah. Um, it, it went from you know a, a way to escape, to a way to celebrate, to a way to wake up, yeah. and then a way to go to bed. You know, and you know people are still out there going through these same things that we went through before. Um, and I know when I was going through it, I was hopeless. You know, I didn't know that there was a way out. I didn't know that there were people in recovery that were willing to help me and point me in the right direction and then guide me through the process um, and then befriend me afterwards. You know, a lot of things that, you know, people think about when it comes time, you know, it's always about I have to go away to rehab. Mm -hmm. I have to give up everything I'm doing right now. I've got to give up my friends, my family, my job, all the things that I know I've got right now. But I promise you, if you start considering the things that you can gain by giving up substances, by changing your friends, by changing your habits, by trust in the process. Because once recovery happens, it's not gonna go perfect. As I said, I was homeless for about eight months living in my car, staying at rest areas on the highway. I would drive to Massachusetts just for a different place to sleep at night. Um, but it was still better than any day I was using, you know? And because I stayed on the journey, because I didn't give in and get high, things got better. And they kept getting better. And, you know, I, I'm on a journey of self-betterment on a daily basis. That's you know, great. giving up the drugs didn't make me a great person either. You know, I was still as much a jerk as I was when I was using. But the recovery process, you know, made me into who I am today and you know I'm not perfect today but I'm going to keep going you know and I'll never be perfect but I'm going to keep going that's awesome you know? and uh, you know Robert so what drives you today in this recovery journey and, and helping people just seeing my friends and neighbors in pain you know it's it's a 
I see myself, and I see I, I'm so happy now. I, I I wanted to live by example, and I was thinking that would be enough, but I'm not that handsome, so it, it didn't work out. So I need to like uh, spread the spread the information, and let people know that okay, relapse. Let's try this again. Okay, you know, never giving up. Never giving up on someone. I think is building these friendships, and like I said, with like forty thousand people on these sites, I know. A couple thousand of them are, are, are pretty good friends of mine that, that we met through this process. And uh, I keep track of them the best I can. And uh, the city of Bangor and, the, and all these organizations, the Bangor Area Recovery Network, the city of Bangor has flipped the script on the way they were two years ago about actually, I have city councils, councilors calling our neighbors without walls, neighbors without walls. Yeah, and because uh, I, I didn't like hearing them referring them to just as the homeless, you know. And uh, I've had uh, Sharps containers put in all over Bangor. I put that pressure on, and they put every one of them exactly where I put on a map where they should put them, because I know where I'm finding them, right? So there's uh, drop, drop boxes all over town. We're just trying to facilitate everyone to do better and keep the city clean as well, because you have to take into consideration the, uh, the neighborhood's opinion, whether you like it or not, you know? And uh, so we've tried to soften those edges a little bit. We moved our food program away from downtown, one park over, and we renamed it the People's Park. And, it, and it's our own park, and it's away from the bus hub, and it does let up some congestion, and there's restaurants over there. They're not trying to have someone hand out food in there. So I, I, I get that, and we've, we try to facilitate. Uh, we work well with the police department to a certain extent, and uh, you know, the fire department is amazing. Like, uh, and I just think everyone's coming around to this new way of thinking that th we can make a difference, but we have to do it all together. No one individual group is gonna, you know, you can save lives, but all together we can take all this information and make one heck of a dent in a big wound that's, that's across this whole country. You know, I, I've seen the progress that you've made in Bangor, and I mean, it, it's quite impressive honestly and uh, you know it, it's a great example of how one person can make a huge difference and there's a thousand people behind me making me look like I'm just the game show host <laughs> there's a million people behind the scene like these guys you yeah. know they're, they're and without those supports I'm dead in the water yeah and a lot of those people would be like helping and not uh, feel the same way about the treatment as much as they're worried about homeless people so I'm getting in there sharing these informations with people with what I would say is like the older generation, and I don't mean to say it in any drug, really needs to be educated that things are different. Yeah. Things are different and uh, nobody's a throwaway. We never give up on anyone. We never give anybody away. I don't care who they are. Yeah. If your heart's beating, I'm here for you. I've just gone through uh, in the past 30 or 40 days dealing with my mental health yeah. because I'm sober, I've been, I'm doing this for three years now, but I still had serious anxiety and, and, and depression. I don't know why, because life is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just started taking an herbal supplement and it made a complete difference. It's called GABA, but uh, you know, it's a, all these, everyone that's out here helping, we are all going through a lot too. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's actually very taxing on you to go through this and see everyone go through this pain and absorb it and try to give back. and. It's, it's heavy, you know that. Yeah. It's very heavy. And, uh, so loving people where they're at today, providing options and resources, and that's the way to do it, you know? That's the way people can make that decision and get the help that they need. And, and knowing that there's all these other uh, programs out there, different options, different opportunities, you know, different programs, different paths, they've all helped somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise they wouldn't be there. You know, that's true. Um, so if, if that's something that's going to help you to get to where you want to be, I'll be there cheering you on. Right. On. You know, is there anything you're working on right now that might be coming up in the future? Uh, well, right. What we would really like to do is solidify our five hundred one c three. We have, we right now we're a nonprofit corporation in the state of Maine, but we're not registered with the federal government yet. So I'm going to pay a bunch of taxes. But uh, you know, we, we would like to get our 501c3. We, we, our intentions was to open the largest uh, uh, shelter in town, or the largest food pantry, the largest clothing distribution, 
and just really amp it up. But all, all those services are already out and about in Bangor, so what we're going to do is uh, liaison and, uh, and get with these other organizations and, and find out how we can all resource together instead of just stretching ourselves to the limit. Mm -hmm. Because there is thousands of us, but there's, there's just me on the, on the boots on the ground. I have some people join me here and there, but it's pretty fleeting. But uh, uh, we would like to just get back to win the meals and get the, as much information as we can so that when someone comes to Bangor, they say, I don't have, you know, and I can help them with housing, that drug treatment piece, mental health. I, I, hit, I shoot right from the hip. I'll tell, tell someone, you, you don't look good. And we need to, if you're, if you're up for it, we could really make a difference in your life. And it's up to you, because yeah. it is up to that person. And, you know, we can offer and borrow and plead, but it all comes down to that person. If you're not ready, you're not ready. Because like I said, I went through AA for years couple bad relationships, you know, getting kicked out of one place to another. I was always able to get that next apartment until this past couple of years when I ended up homeless, but it was just a, a nightmare. But uh, you, you'd think somewhere along the way I would have took that advice that I was actually giving other people at some point in there. But I, there was no pivotal moment where I quit drinking. I just said, I'm not drinking anymore on October 15th, 2018. Well, if someone's in the Bangor area, what we would love to do is have someone uh, prepare a meal and, and come down with me and help me serve people and get to know the process and uh, bring more people ab ab abroad. But we also have our Streetlight, uh, People Streetlight Outreach Facebook page. And uh, like once a week, we do a, f uh, a Facebook fundraiser for $400, which covers $50 a day for eight days. So that extra, I know there's not eight days in a week, but that extra covers, so, which isn't, it costs a lot more than $50 a day to do this. Yeah. And then uh, I'll have people come and bring me boxes of food and I put it in our pantry and we build a meal. You know, there's a lot of big ziti. And, uh, you know, but we bring a hot meal and what's the way someone could help really is just to keep track of our People Street Light Outreach Facebook page and, and look for cues to, to pitch in. Yeah, Lori and I have joined you a couple times. Um, you know, I wish we were closer to Bangor. We'd definitely be there more often. Um, because we see the interaction that you have, the effect you're having on the people that, that come. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we did come up in the summertime when there was, you know, a larger crowd of people. Um, and it's great to see the number dwindle. Yes. I, I, I've always said that I would love to go down there and have nobody. Right. I'd like to show up there with food for 100 and no one's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be something great. Uh, thanks, Robert. All right, all right. Uh, I love seeing you. I'm I love so it. happy you made it down today. And, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing uh, because you are making a difference. That's it. From Bangtown to P Town. That's what I was saying this morning. <laughs> Great. Thanks for watching another episode of Recover Loud. Please remember if you're struggling or if you know somebody that's struggling, please reach out. We'd much rather talk you through a situation than read about your untimely death tomorrow. Recover Loud, everybody. Much more. Say every time I call, you pick up the phone, and always reminding me that I'm not alone, and even when I'm scared and my feet are frozen, you help me keep it going like a semicolon. Every time I fall, you just pick me up. Say you was down a ride through the thickest mud, and you was on my side when I was slipping up. And even when I made you cry, you still give me love. So I gotta thank God I've gained. So no matter what it costs, yeah, I'll be willing to pay. Cause every time I call, you pick up the phone, and always reminding me that. That I'm not alone and even when I'm scared and my feet are frozen you help me keep it going like a semicolon so I'ma follow your steps for all of the way I put my faith in you and walk on the waves and if I stumble a bit and fall on my face you come and save me with all of your grace yeah thank God